All right, shall we get started? What do you think? Sure. All right, well, welcome everyone to this book launch for In Search of Climate Politics. And this is a celebration, so we should start with a toast, which we, if we had drinks, we would have a toast. Congratulations, Matt, on In Search of Climate Politics. Woo! Everyone. <laughs> We have to make these things a celebration. Uh, also to say before anybody uh, wonders, there is a discount code. If you'd like to order the book, uh, you can go onto the Cambridge University Press website and type in the code SCP2021. And get your own copy. Um, but anyway, my name is Sherilyn McGregor and I'm going to uh, chair the uh, book launch this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to introduce Matt and Rebecca Willis in a minute, but I just want to say that I'm very pleased to be able to chair the event this afternoon, not only because it's a great book by a brilliant scholar and generous colleague, but also because I think I'm probably the only person in the room who's actually born in Ottawa. <laughs> Is that right? Did you plan it this way, Matt? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so yes, I was born in Ottawa. So as an as an Ottawa Ottawa one, Ottawa one, a former Ottawa one, I can also say that it's really nice that Matt has done this research to be able to put Ottawa, um, which is often ignored as a rather beige and boring capital city, on the map as a kind of microcosm of climate politics. But I can also say that we really should pronounce Ottawa, Matt will say Ottawa, but it's Ottawa because um, it's actually an indigenous word, Ottawa, A-D-A-W-A, -A which, uh, which is an indigenous word um, meaning trade or traders. Um, and if we were in Ottawa right now, we would say that Ottawa is on the unceded land of the Algonquin nation. So just to say that, and we, we're not in Ottawa, but I want you to realize you don't say Ottawa. Right, Matt? Yes. <laughs> Although it is also the case that why Anglo settlers say Ottawa because they don't pronounce their T's in general. <laughs> well, see, I have, I have an excuse now. Anyway, um, so that's 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 all my joke, I think. Um, so anyway, well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to turn over to uh, Matt to say about ten minutes uh, of a kind of discussion or sort of opening comments about his book, and then turn over to Rebecca Willis to com to provide some commentary for about uh, twenty minutes or so, and then we'll open up for. Uh, for conversation. Um, and so Q&A at the end, but please leave any questions about truckers till the very end, okay? Um, right, so introduce Matt. Um, I think all of you know Matt. Uh, he's the interim and incoming, incoming director of the Sustainable Consumption Institute and professor of international politics here at the University of Manchester. He was formerly a professor at the University of Ottawa, Ottawa where he um, <laughs> did the research for this book. Um, and it's very lovely to have uh, Professor Rebecca Willis here with us, um, who is a professor of energy and climate governance at Lancaster University, um, also a, a UKRI Future Leader Fellow, and she's currently leading um, the Climate Citizens Project, which is examining the role of public engagement in climate politics. So over to you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Becky, for coming. Um, thanks, everyone, for, to, for coming up. Um, I'm going to say a few thank yous, and then I'm going to both about, in general, about the event, about the book. I'm going to say what I think the book is trying to do, or where I was coming to from it, and what I was trying to do. And I'm just going to give two very quick vignettes from a couple of the chapters um, that are hopefully give you a flavour of what's going on in it. Um, uh, thank you, first and foremost, to Sophie over there, and Natalie Pell, who's online somewhere, and um, Holly as well, or Holly gone already, for organising and uh, putting the, the event together. Um, thanks also to Clara Sandlin, who I think might be online, or she, oh, I don't know, who, for the prompt, uh, in saying, yes. why don't you do a book launch? I was actually thinking of it anyway, it would be nice to do, but it was nice to have to kick up the arse from Clara to act, make it happen, so thank you for that. Um, and then the other thank you is really a segue into the book and thank, uh, into the book itself, which is that um, 
I'll, I'll pass. I'll pass the coffee around. People in the room, anyway. And I want to show the coffee <coughs> come over. As so when you go into it, you'll see. Even though I claim that the book is by me, quite a lot of the chapters are not only by me. They have co-authors, and that's sort of partly a segue into why, I, what, how this book came about. Um, so it has a number of origins. One is that I had a grant, the last grant I had while I was in Canada, called uh, Cultural Politics of Climate Change. Um, and what I was interested in exploring in general in lots of different ways in that project was, if you like, the conflicts over practices and activities in daily life and the meanings we attach to those activities that become made contentious in climate change politics, implicitly or explicitly. About. It doesn't always have to be explicitly called about climate change, but nevertheless, um, that, those, those questions of daily life. And one aspect of that was to look at climate change within the city of Ottawa. And it's not really a book about climate change and cities as such, but it was just that was the site where a lots, of, lots of these conflicts over daily life, whether that's to do with housing, whether that's to do with work, whether that's to do with um, transport planning and a range of things, which are really central to how climate change is generated greenhouse gas emissions and so on, uh, and the responses to climate crisis, um, but are also really central both to the economy of a city and to the daily activities that everybody goes about in their daily lives, getting to work or school or wherever. So that was the sort of one of the logics. And what I did in, in the context of that grant is we did a mapping exercise and looked at all the activities going on around climate change by NGOs, by the city government, by so on. And then I got a bunch of students on the MA programmes that we had said, if you want to uh, write your MA dissertation or major research paper that we call there about this, one of these things, then go for it. I'll chuck you some money to uh, pay, pay for you to do that so you don't have to do some teaching assistantships instead. Um, and then we'll see where that goes. And the ones that end up going somewhere, hopefully we'll end up with a book. So that's the sort of origin of that, and it became a collaboration in different ways with different students, because you know, it's normal, but um, um, that's the sort of thing. I'm really pleased with how that aspect of it worked out as well. Um, a couple of the students, are, or now ex-students, are online, I think, Bora Plumtree and uh, Kofi Adamaka Ejiapong, hopefully. So we said they were coming. There may be others as well who will <laughs> highlight them. Bora, yes, thank you. And he's <laughs> very uh, smart. Um, move anyway, and I'm not sure is coffee there. Um, anyway, um, so thank you to them for that collaboration and putting some faith that I wasn't going to just ruthlessly exploit them. Um, I don't think I did. I hope not. I think it worked out reasonably well. Bora has agreed to answer some of Becker's questions or your questions about the chapter he was involved in. So uh, you know, he knew what he meant to be at some point later on. A and so in some senses, that point about the cultural politics of climate change is exemplified in the cover of the book, which is also behind Bora's uh, thing now pinned at the top left of the screen, <laughs> handily. Um, this is actually the, the building I used to work in. Um, it's the Social Science Building at the University of Ottawa. Um, it's the, it, when it was built, it was the largest living wall in Canada, six-storey living wall, that is the principal air conditioning for the, for the whole building. The building is cooled by a nine, a six, six story um, set of plants, and it was heated by a two story set of computer servers. They moved the servers instead of putting a, car, a two story car park into the basement, which is the absolute standard. You go to any office building in North America, there's a two story car park underneath the building. Instead of doing that, they put the university, they reorganized all the university servers and heated the building from it, from the waste heat. Um, so it's a good example of one of the aspects of what's going on i think in the in well, one of the things i ended up arguing in the book um is is that um which i'll now come on to so what i ended up wanting to argue in the book out of this material is that what we see in climate change politics if we want to say what, what i found when i saw thought the climate change politics is an intertwined set of two dynamics one is that politics Climate change is routinely depoliticized. People, various actors for varying reasons seek to take it out of the set, presented as if it is not political, it's simply a technical question, an economic question, a question of population, a question of capitalism. Um, no, that's no, forget that last example. That's a different um, uh, 
and not something that is subject to the public democratic arenas and is not something that's about the fundamental power relations within society. Um, and on the other hand, you get people contesting exactly that, right? seeking to bring it back into the arena of public debate, um, explicit politicization, usually also to contest some aspect of power relations, which are being obscured by the depoliticization. Um, so that's one tension. Um, and the point I would want to, well, and, and the second dynamic of tension that I try and talk about is that there's a tendency from actors to, to purify climate change, to abstract it to its sort of simplest elements. Um, again, classic examples, it's just a question of prices, you get the price right, um, and magically everything falls into place. There are actually economists who believe that, and have weird reactions from some economists, not all economists, in fact, probably the minority of economists, where they literally think all you have to do is get the carbon price right and everything will magically slot into place. Or it's a question of some magic technological fix. You know, once we get the battery life sorted, or once, the, uh, once we get you know, green hydrogen or whichever one, thorium, uh, or some, some magic technology will solve, solve everything, um, et cetera. Versus the idea that climate change is intrinsically extraordinarily complex. It involves shifting these huge socio-technical systems that have multiple actors involved. They're all different as well, but you know, that solving the problem of decarbonizing the food supply is not the same problem as decarbonizing energy or transport or other aspects. And they all have, we have to pay attention to these enormous complexities. The example of the, the University of Ottawa is what is exactly on the sort of complexity side of things. So what goes on in the, there's a chapter in the book on the University of Ottawa, where what you get is, um, uh, over a 35-year period, extraordinarily patient, detailed attention by the Estates Department at the University of Ottawa, and I have to say, having moved here six and a half, five and a half years ago, the exact opposite of the business cult working culture in the Estates Department at the University of Manchester. Um, so a really experimental leadership by a bunch of curious engineers who want to solve problems in buildings. Um, from about 1974 onwards, with the effect that the University of Ottawa has tripled in size in terms of the student body, and its absolute energy consumption has gone down by about 10%. Um, that is not the case at the University of Ottawa at Manchester. Um, and they started with simple things like putting combined heat and power systems in, their own power plant and then distributing the waste heat. Um, and they are now at the point of, in a meeting like this, the excess body heat would be being recirculated into the heating and cooling system of the university from all of us. Um, so let your students in lecture halls are actually supplying heat to the university. Uh, they've got heat exchanges on the outflow of every single um, shower in the, in the university. I don't know about every single, but you know, they are progressively doing that. Across. They're down to those micro level of details um in terms of energy management um and what 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 thing i think is interesting so it's a really good example of where that depoliticized technocratic patient sort of intervention series of progressive interventions become progressively more experimental so i think one of the buildings now in the win winter it's proper winters proper winters no, it's what <laughs> she's a refugee from the twins. um uh they put, a, put massive blocks of ice on the top of the building because it's that easy to do in January when it's minus 22 overnight routinely. Um, and that becomes the air conditioning for that building for the rest of the year. And so just recirculating relatively cool air. Um, they don't have, in the building, like in this building, they don't have any thermometers. They only have calm dioxide monitors. There's just no bit about climate change. It's about 420 ones outside at the moment. Something like that, isn't it? Um, it's, it, it will have been about 500 when, when this meeting started in this room, and it will go up to about 700 during the course of the hour and a bit that we're all in. Um, all they do at, in that building is when it gets up to about 750, 800, they recirculate air from elsewhere in the university system. And if it needs to get cooler, they circulate cool air from somewhere where it's cooler. If it needs to warm up, they circulate a bit of heat from those servers in the basement. 
um, and that's it. Right? So you actually get wider, much wider temperature variation um, across the year and things like that. Anyway, so that's one example where the um, depoliticized, it's not only the case, not always the case that repoliticizing in the sense I've studied is always a good thing. And the other thing that's, that goes on in that chapter is that there's a divestment, a fossil fuel divestment campaign went on on campus at this same sort of time. Um, and I was helping students with that campaign and you know, giving them bits and bobs of information and so on. Um, as the same, it was going on lots of other campuses. And what was not obvious was what they, uh, and that campaign sort of succeeded and even though the university wouldn't admit that they were doing it, they did in fact divest. Um, but it wasn't obvious in the ways that it shifted the attention of senior university managers to questions of climate change, that it was necessarily a good thing for this, this bit of the picture. Because the university managers, what happened once the divestment campaign worked is that the finance office got really interested in climate change in ways that they didn't care about it before. They just let the energy managers get on with it. Suddenly they're starting to think out about where, how they're spending their money. And it's not obvious that that would always have a positive effect on all these experimental emissions. So I think that's one example of a story where to try and tell is this, you have to understand, I think these two dynamics is intertwined in like tensions rather than always taking one side. It's always good to repoliticize, always good to make it more complex. Um, so that's sort of where I'm trying to get to thinking about that in the opening and the concluding chapters and contextualize it much more beyond Ottawa. I've probably talked for 10 minutes. I could give other examples. I was going to give another one, but I think I will leave it there and let Becky uh, give her comments and ask questions or anything, whatever you'd like to do. So hopefully that gives you a little um, sketch of what, what we're trying to do in this book and hopefully why it's interesting. Great. Do you want me to yeah. just dive Please in? Do, yeah. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for the invite. I felt a bit giddy uh, coming here from Lancaster because it's only about the sort of second or third um, thing I've done in person. So it's very <laughs> exciting to get on a train, have a coffee. That was lovely. And um, and and uh, yeah, I think um, I just wanted to note what you said about the collaboration, Matt, as well. The way that this this book is a is a team effort, and I think it's really nice the way that you've articulated that and put that in the book. So, just wanted to note that. Um, I'll I'll give you some sort of comments and reactions, and then um, a few sort of talking points that we might want to take forward. Um, I, I won't call them criticism because. It, it, I found the book incredibly illuminating because it sort of makes explicit uh, um, a lot of what I think is very implicit whenever we talk about climate change, and, and I'll explain that. Um, but the so so, so I, I I couldn't really I couldn't get my teeth into some serious critique, but maybe I'll warm up and see what it gets <laughs> me. <laughs> um, in terms of reactions, I mean, the first thing, and this is, I'm sort of stepping back here. The first thing that I, I really like about your approach in this book and, and what you've done before is that it's very, it's very practical. It's very pragmatic. You could even say pragmatist. I don't know what you think about that. No, you don't like that? Okay, let's stick with practical or pragmatic. What I mean is that it is describing the politics that we have in the here and now and then theorizing about that, rather than doing the opposite of theorizing your ideal, ideal type definition and then comparing where we are. And I think that the state we're in, both with politics and with climate, absolutely requires a very resolute focus on, frankly, the messiness of what we see both in climate and in politics. And maybe this is, uh, you know, my prejudice as someone who has only been back in academia for six or seven years and had um, a decade, more than a decade, working very closely with government, with, with think tanks as a government advisor and so on, where all the focus is on the messiness of the everyday. For my taste, a bit too much in that it's very hard to lift your sights to the to the horizon to the bigger picture. But you know, it, it, when you're working sort of 
up close with with government or trying to lobby government it's all about the messiness of the everyday and so an academia that just sort of tries to define your ideal end point i don't find helpful and that's why the sort of let's stick with pragmatic sort of pragmatic approach of this and and, and analyzing um a city and the politics of the city in that in that context is 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 really really useful um the 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 second thing is that i um i think with your dynamic of depoliticization and repoliticization and also complexity and purification that is a re the reason i was flicking through the book just now is i wondered whether i had missed a uh, a matrix <laughs> <laughs> and whether um because what i would I, th I think if i was talking about this with 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 students what i'd actually quite like to do is plot a um a, i'm not sure if it's a graph or a matrix but you'd have an axis for depoliticization yeah no it's not that it's not that um you would, you would have a you would have a, an axis which is you know depoliticization to repoliticization and you would have an axis of um complexity and purification and you could pick an issue, any issue, and see where it maps on that. And it's a really, really useful way of maybe getting a bit of distance from all the um, discussions, arguments, uh, <laughs> fights sometimes that we get ourselves into around climate. So um, maybe I'll have a go at that. You know. <laughs> um, but I mean, just to give you a, a couple of examples of that, 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 that book, a couple of ideas that the book uh, promoted in me. I think it's really important that you said um, that, you know, depoliticization isn't bad or good, nor is repoliticization. And same with the complexity and purification um, sort of spectrum, because, I mean, depoliticization is maybe more likely to be problematic um we see depoliticization in the uk climate change act for example when um the original the original act was passed with very little political debate um even less political debate surrounding the uh the um, amendment in 2019 which took us from 80 percent reductions to net zero i mean absolutely huge deal right getting to i mean i don't need to tell this audience but an absolutely huge deal getting to net zero emissions and yet it was sort of passed with virtually no parliamentary debate i find that really strange and i find that it you know the danger then is that you store up problems and I, you know i really worry that what we're seeing now with the net zero scrutiny group and so on is exactly those chickens coming home to roost so I think um, depoliticization can be really problematic. Carbon removal as well. The idea that you sort of model for carbon removal and, and, and assume that it will happen, assume that the, and assume that there isn't any politics in this sort of, you know, do we remove or do we reduce, I think is really problematic. So, but having said that, there are some senses in which depoliticization is, is, is really useful. And I think you, you know, you outline some of those in the book. Um, an example for me is a, is a is is actually quite a momentous conversation I had with someone very senior in Lancaster University where we were talking about flying in the in the university and and Lancaster like Manchester has recently branched out into actually um, having um, campuses overseas having what that what what we call at Lancaster flying faculty and um, you know I was sort of we were at a workshop about academic flying and I was sort of questioning this quite gently with someone very senior in the in the university who then said to me well if that's not going to be compatible with net zero we should stop doing it and it was kind of a weirdly non-political comment and I actually found that really useful because it was sort of like a, a, you know we, we, we shouldn't be doing it where's the problem there let's just move away from that and the in a weird way, that, that was deliberately political, saying that it wasn't political, <laughs> but that's not tying myself in knots. But I, I think that depoliticization is sometimes uh, is, is sometimes a useful tactic. Another example is the International Energy Agency just saying, look, there's no, actually no politics around coal mines. We just can't open them anymore. That's just incompatible with global climate budgets. And, you know, I'm not making a political case. I'm, you know, I'm just stating the fact so that it can be useful. Um, 
on the complexity and purification point, again, I mean, there's so much that you could unpack in that. I find that complexity is often used as a, as, 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 a, as a weapon. It's certainly a weapon of choice now from people who used to deny the science and who now, um, are, you might have seen the brilliant work on discourses of delay um, by William Lamb and colleagues, the idea that you can't deny the science anymore because you know, it's happening, but what you can do is put every roadblock you can think of in the way. And one of those, uh, not one, lots of those roadblocks are around complexity. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's too difficult. There are, um, you know, there are side effects. Uh, we're not sure yet. Um, you know, all that kind of thing. So I think complexity is a, is a political weapon and that's, and that's um, really important. And the flip side of that is that um, while I agree with some of the problems of purification, I think that the big problem of climate change is, in descriptive terms at least, really simple, that the, what we need to do about it is really simple, right? We need to stop digging the fossil fuels up. We need to stop burning them. We need to do some stuff around uh, land use and agriculture, including carbon removal. We possibly need to do some stuff around, you know, mechanical technological carbon removal. And then we need to adapt and do all we can on damage, damage limitation. It's, you know, actually, it's incredibly simple. It only becomes complex when you unpack the effects of, you know, if we're really serious about not, not digging fossil fuels out the ground anymore, what does that mean for the economies of fossil fuel producing countries? What does that mean for the oil majors? And then the cascades are intensely complex and intensely political. But I think it's worth bearing in mind that the, you know, that the, the fundamentals are a lot simpler than than some sort of climate uh, delayers um, want to, to make out. Um, so you know we could play around a lot with 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 your with these um with these axes like that the last thing i think is that is really useful about the book is its focus on 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 a place um and the extent to which a lot of climate politics comes back to place-based discussions and that what seems sort of abstract and apolitical at the level of the the nation state or um the you know, climate negotiations sometimes um, is not apolitical, but it sometimes seems that way, actually gets real when you take it down to the context of where people, you know, live and work and raise families and study and so on. Um, and I really noticed this, um, there's some analysis that I've just been doing, um, interviewing civil servants in the UK, um, about how they think of how how governance treats people um, and what kind of language and framings is used for people and a really interesting finding that I didn't expect was that because they are um, national policy makers everything that they told me everything is done at such a level of abstraction that they don't actually make a connection to people's lives and the changes that their policies will engender in people's lives. And it's just about possible, I would argue difficult now, but just about possible to get away with that abstraction at the level of national politics. Um, but it's almost impossible to do at the city level when you're talking about where people live, how they travel around and so on. And so I think that scale is really, really important. So my... Um, my talking points, um, the things that, I, I mean, I would, I would love, I, sp I suppose these are the things that I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear back from you on, Matt. Um, the first is, it relates back to what I said about whether climate is, is a kind of simple or very complex issue. The, the first thing I'd ask is whether you can actually um, reduce, whether you can actually think of climate politics as both a, a, a big problem and a series of small problems. And I'm indebted to my colleague, Jacob Ainsgaff, who I think, I saw his name, I think he's on the call. He kind of said this to me once offhand, and I was like, that is genius insight. Basically, the big problem of climate politics, you know, it can't be overstated in its, in its, in its, in its size. It is, at a planetary scale, 
how can we organise ourselves collectively to, um, to avert climate catastrophe? It's like, you know, the biggest issue that we've ever faced. And it is, it, you know, any other political problem is dwarfed by that. How we continue to, you know, manage human society and um, other, other species um, and earth systems and so on. So it's, it's, it's the biggest problem that politics has ever faced. And at the same time, it is a, a, an almost infinite number of small problems, um, as you articulate in the book with your, you know, the various sites of climate politics in the city, um, as we're seeing now over, you know, the, the emerging politics in, in, in the UK around cycle lanes and low traffic networks and, you know, which I, I know that you, you've studied a lot in the past, as happened, the example that I just gave, the, the work that Lancaster University has been involved in, in terms of um, the, the contribution or otherwise of, 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 of uh, global mobility, of flying to academia, both for staff and students, all these are sites of individual battles. And I think that the, I'd, I'd be really interested to, to, to hear your views on how that, um, how, you know, the one big problem <laughs> links or doesn't link in different sites to all those small problems and the extent to which the big problem gets played out in those small problems. Um, the, 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 the second point I'd really like to hear from you on, and, and um, you know, this is not at all an original comment, but that you know you make a really strong case that climate politics is everywhere. But in doing so, is there a danger of making it um, so distributed that it's actually quite hard to work out what we do? Um, and specifically, um, how do we there if we say politics is everywhere, which I, you know, I, I agree it is. Is there something still special about that specific domain of what you might call formal politics in terms of, you know, governance systems um, in that they are explicitly talking about systems that are supposed to um, act in the public interest um, and that have the ability to uh, to, to, to coerce and to restrict um, for the sake of a, of a, of a collective good. I mean, the, the kind of idealised view of politics, um, you know, how, can, how, how do we make sure that we don't lose sight of essentially the role of the state and its powers um, if we are taking that, that diffuse um, definition of politics? Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, to a certain extent, contradict myself with my third talking point. Um, that, and I know this is something that you've written on in the past, so I'd be really interested to know how the two link up. I think the other thing that's really struck me in, in, in all these climate politics battles is the, the extent to which there's a cultural or discursive or sociological aspect to them. Um, in other words, how sort of established forms of particular settings are incredibly important in defining what the issue is and how you deal with it. So a couple of examples. One is that in my um, uh, research interviewing members of parliament in the UK, um, there was a strong feeling among them that if they spoke out on climate, they would be seen as sort of outsiders, freaks, zealots, those are the words they use. And so there were strong cultural norms being placed on them um, to stop them speaking out, to stop them talking about that big problem, if you like, that we're heading for a really unpleasant uh, living conditions. Um, you know, they, 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 they couldn't, they, they, they sort of knew that, but couldn't speak out about it because they were worried about how they would be branded and, and, and therefore the prospects for their career and so on. And that might sound, you know, the career point might sound like they're sort of um, 
a very shallow, but if you remember that we want people who are deeply concerned about climate at the very top of our politics, then you know that it is problematic if they're being cast out mm -hmm. of outsiders. And the second example is one that I've lived through over the past two years, the politics around the new coal mine in Cumbria. And it, depending on what room you walk into, in what place, there are embedded assumptions about whether that coal mine is a good or bad thing. And when you meet people who are for the coal mine, they kind of take a step back and say, what, you, you're not supporting these jobs? You're not supporting the local, you know, what? like, of, of course we should have a coal mine here. We really want a coal mine here. You know, uh, climate's well and good, but this is, what, this is what it's like in this place. Compared with, you know, my view, which is, why would you open a coal mine in, you know, in, in, in 2022? Um, you know, so, so those kind of entrenched views and the, the, the world views and even the, the status and the norms that are associated with them, I think are, are really, really important. And I know that, you know, other work of yours has looked at that, but it, it didn't, for me, it didn't come through so much in, in this book. So I think that it's, you know, it's, it's something maybe interesting to, to talk through. Um, I think um, I, 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 I tried to make that coherent by having a number of points, but apart from that, I don't think it was particularly coherent. That. So I mean, you know, feel free, feel free to feel free to jump on. I wasn't just on Twitter. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, feel free to jump on any or any or none of them. Um, yes, why don't I do just respond? Is that what yeah, you're yeah, absolutely. So, well, thank you. Those moments are very nice. Um, uh, yeah, your struggle with the word pragmatism and whichever version, then I uh, was thinking, yeah, yeah, that, yes, I can, yes. Um, I mean, I suppose that the, 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 the way that it comes in this book, and it came with it, the book that I did with Pete Newell 10 years ago, Climate Capitalism, where we also got, I don't know, tied up in knots, but certainly got attacked for it by some people we might normally call our friends, um, is that sense that for me, it's, I mean, yes, I've got certain theoretical and political instincts about capitalism in terms of essentials in particular, but I don't find it very useful to dig into something really, dig into the messiness and have that always to front and center as a sort of obvious commitment. And so it's, I do find it helpful to put that aside and then come back to it. Uh, and I do think that with this in a different way to that book 10 years ago, it engages what I think, you know, the literature on climate politics that I survey there, that I think has happened in your book, Too Hot to Handle, Becky Wilson has a read book from two, two years ago, three years ago, which is excellent. I launched it in the first week of lockdown, that wasn't That was <laughs> like, timing, timing. My timing's slightly better, but not much. The, um, um, but but a lot of that literature is talking. Essentially, I would put on the repoliticisation associated with repoliticisation of climate change. I think it starts with Eric Swindley's article on post politics climate change. In a way, I think that's a lot of a sort of grounding article for lots of those debates. But the climate Leviathan book and you know a variety of others, uh, Amanda Machen's negotiating climate change book and so on, more of a Chantal Mouffe origin than a Marxist origin, but a lot of those ones. And then of course, movements, the climate justice movements, the divestment, the, you know, all those campaign um, anti-pipeline ones, the people opposing the truckers in Ottawa, <laughs> uh, or the people who the truckers are essentially a backlash against, even if it's currently about vaccine mandates, it's really a, just a sort of right-wing populist. Mm. And they would be doing it about climate policy if they weren't doing it about vaccines. Mm. Um, the, um, that all of that contestation and its theorization was a sort of backdrop for what I was doing here, but where I have, I, I always felt a bit uneasiness with the hardness with which um, that sort of anti-capitalist post-political claim is being made. So I think that sort of fits there. I was interested in what you said about complexity as an obstacle. I haven't really thought of it that way, but I think it's a reasonable other way into that. I did think about doing a sort of trying to work out that. And I did, the obvious one is a, is a two by two box, but I definitely didn't want to do that because that makes them really static and really separate. And the point is that they interact and they're in some dynamic tension way that that would capture. But maybe you're two lines and placing actors and their claims within that. The other point that I want 
think about one the, the point you made about depersonalization and the returns is I think I don't think I say it very well here, but in a couple of conversations since it's come out, I think one of the things that's quite or in presentations that I've done, mm -hmm. um, that my favorite one, which we've used in teaching one, is, is you'll see it, you'll see it's so easy to find, is a, uh, 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 a photo of a woman on a climate justice march where it says climate first, politics second, or politics later. Is it that? That's the one. And the other one you said, the other obvious example is that is the splinter group from XR calling itself the Beyond Politics mm -hmm. Party. Just, just well, at one level, just simply an absurd. Right? Um, but it's that sense that you, we can distinguish between depersonalization as a rhetorical strategy. We think this should not be political, right? It's the first chapter, first page of your book where you cite James Lovelock as the, as the sort of stat, you know, the extreme version of that. I think it's time to put democracy on a hold for a minute, don't you? Right? Um, so depersonalization is a rhetorical strategy even at the same time as the actions being undertaken are seriously repoliticized, uh, maybe with the exception of James Lovelock, but you know, being on a march and saying politics, <laughs> it's yeah. just like, how does that work, right? So there's this mismatch between, I think that needs a bit more thinking, I don't think it's, it's not really in my head. Um, on your three questions, um, how does the big play out in the small? If we can, I mean, I think at one level you think that that's a useful way in, into that. And certainly the problem of the what I would call the sort of purified repoliticization, which is mostly anti-capitalist arguments, um, or anti-corporate arguments, certainly. Fossil fuel is the enemy story, Bill McKibben's story, Ben Klein or something like that. Um, is that the political struggle, the contestation of power relations only operates at this ultra macro level, like this rather abstract level. And you see that, certainly see that in something like that. Eric's work, to my mind. It's like, I would really struggle to work out what that means at the level of a specific conflict or mm -hmm. site or place. Um, but on the other hand, it is the case that most of the most of the work that either by the actors themselves or the academic work focusing on specific sites and micro things doesn't connect up to the big picture. You know, it is the case that in, um, you gave an example, but now I'm, I'm going to forget, I didn't make enough notes clearly, um, where I thought the trouble is, um, what's wrong there? Where, where actually those big picture power of you know, the oil companies or whoever really does structure these. Um, micro events. So, in the, I mean, the obvious example at the urban scale in this book is actually, and this is quite different, it's not totally different, but it's quite different. North American cities in most parts of Canada and the US, not absolutely everywhere, not in Quebec, not in Van Vancouver, probably some American cities. Political parties do not operate at the local level. So, there's no political party. Everybody knows that Councillor X is a member of the NDP or the Conservative Party or the Liberals or whoever, but there's no party organization which means that campaign finance at urban level is entirely dominated by property developers. They are the single corporate biggest corporate donor to local politicians by a long way. And not difficult to see why they do that. Right? They, are the, you know, they, are, they are the exons of the urban scale in, in North American urban politics. It's a big part of the politics of the dark, of the well, there's a there you can really see at the same time as in, in the chapter that's the two chapters that are about transport and planning and housing and so on in different slightly different ways. You know, you at the one level you've got this big essentially the corporate capitalist political economy of the city at that sort of macro level. At the same time as you've got these micro people worrying about their neighborhood and objecting to the height of buildings. Um, being, you know, so to the extent that the issue there in most North American cities is if you're really going to low, lower energy consumption and decolonize cities, then you can't do that without dealing with sprawl and it's a massive low density issue problem. Um, much less of an issue, not, not an issue here, but less, much less of an issue. Density is key. Um, and so what happens that gets driven by the political economy of these corporate developers who want to build high because that's how they maximize the profit from the ground rent of the particular plot that they pay, which is going to be expensive. Um, 
And so they're happy with the intensification push for density. They do it by building high. Everybody locally objects. So you've got this cultural tension around the sort of political economy dynamics, which you've got to sort of simultaneously, I think, pay attention to those micro things going on that are really place specific. Um, uh, and, and the macro dynamic with the, the city politics is really run by the property politics and all the property politics. So I do think that's sort of, um, I don't part of our response mm -hmm. to that like, top question. Um, it, uh, what about centrality of the state? I mean, it's true that when you, you miss that, and there's a, there's a sort of case made that which you made as well, which is that one of the things the value of looking at cities is you do see the detailed transactions, or the height of buildings or heritage neighbourhoods. And one of the things I was thinking about, you know, the, the university example, and the meetings I've been in with all of course, all our consultants for Siemens, I'm probably not the only person in the room who's been in those meetings. Um, what becomes clear here is that about I don't know, it's about a third of the buildings on campus have got a, a, a listed. And so actually doing anything about them is like really regulated, not only by the cultural value of a attachment to a certain aesthetic, but of what it means to be in a 19th century sort of set of buildings, but the actual you know, institutionalization that in a set of rules about what can and can't be done to those buildings. And you and I both live around the edges of national parks where you know, the planning, planning stuff in, in those rural areas are you know, also really, really central. Um, so yeah, if you do miss those central things about the state, but I don't think you miss those. I, I was slightly surprised by your third point in a way, because I think that was sort of what I was trying to really pay attention to sort of deep habits and norms, the chapter of on complete streets, where it's, you know, what a street is supposed to look like. And then mm. the people traveling through that street for whom the central value is how long is it going to take me to get to work? And where three minutes really mattered to them. And, the, and the, there was a strategy by the energy, like when they were building, they were doing this thing called the police, which is roughly like the Oxford Road corridor. But it's essentially repositioning a street from being just about cars, shifting through as fast as possible, being about multiple uses, bikes, public transport, non-transport uses of the space, et cetera. Um, and, they, and the city's bottom has done that in a number of places now, but that, that chapter's about one specific conflict over one of these pioneer ones. And then the, the, the city engineers and their consultants and the planners thought they were going to diffuse the political conflict by commissioning a study to say, well, just how much time would the car commuters we've got who would go with this redesign from having two lanes each way to one lane each way, um, how much would they lose? And they, and they thought, well, it's only three minutes. And then this three minutes becomes this massive explosion. Um, so it's actually culturally meaningful to be in ways that... You know, so I do think you get to that. I, I wanted to get to that sort of minutia of the detail of what precisely gets people really upset. And it is things like the amount of time on their commute, the height of the building next to them, the um, et cetera. Um, and the complexities of that. So there's one observation in that planning density chapter, which I really like, I really like, I'd love to explore in other contexts, is the councillors who are most likely to be in favour of really strong city action on climate change and knew that containing sport was central to that, uh, were the most likely to object to individual building projects that would be, that would increase the city's density. Right? And so it was the left liberal Greenies, David Chernyshenko, you know, people like that, not that anybody knows any of his names, but um, uh, city centre councillors, ward councillors, who were gonna object to all of these new projects, even though it was those that would increase the density and they said they wanted to increase density to have a really strong climate action within the city. Uh, and it's because of the, the attachment to a competing set of environmental, social environmental questions about the aesthetics of height and uh, what, a neighbor, what an ideal neighborhood looks like and et cetera, which the, the way that intensification is gonna be pursued because it's driven by the interests of the property developers would never be what I mean. So it's those, those complexities that are really, I think focusing on these mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. places really helps, but you're right, but it doesn't get to, and there's a bit in that last chapter to say, well, there's, there's clearly going to be distinctions about what happens at the national regulation. And there is that point that you made about, it's more abstract, right? Nobody, nobody instituting a carbon tax in Whitehall is ever going to, be, you know, like when Macron brought in his carbon tax at the same time as he 
stripped away a bunch of sort of tax. They were super rich. Um, nobody sitting there designing that carbon tax could predict the sort of political backlash because they didn't. I mean, maybe they could. I don't know. But it's sort of that's that's got because it's that separation between the fiscal policy bit and the daily activities, which it's going to have an effect on. And they're sort of distanced from it because of the nature of the institutions. Of it. But thanks. Have you got any? Have I missed anything? Or? No, I think that was, yeah. Great, yeah. thanks to you both, and thanks for everyone for listening.